This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Mark Blythe. He is the Eastman Professor of Political Economy at Brown University. He is also a professor of political science and international public affairs. Mark's research focuses on, and gee, you're going to see why I wanted to have Mark on, but his research focuses on how uncertainty and randomness impact complex systems, particularly economic systems, and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas despite buckets of evidence to the contrary. Mark is a great talker, a great Scott. He brings it straight, no BS, right to the heart of the matter, strong opinions, strong research, a really wise individual. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mark Blythe. My first big picture question that I think perhaps is even the most important question that I can possibly ask today, which is, did you start deadlifting because of Nassim or were you doing it on your own in advance? Not in advance. It was coterminous. What happened was we actually hadn't been in touch for a little while after the publication of Anti-Fragile, not because of fallen out or anything like that, just, you know, schedules, agendas, the whole thing. I remember, actually, I read the IYI, Intellectual Yet Idiots, piece in Medium, which I just thought was hilarious, brilliant, and, you know, insane at the same time, in a good way. At the end of it, it says, and they don't deadlift. And I went, well, I do, and I have been doing since, actually, I mean, I've been deadlifting, well, I'm 50 now. I've been deadlifting since I was 42, so I've been doing this for a long time. I used to do heavy squats for a long time. I'm more of a a crazy yoga maniac these days, but I appreciate the deadlifting. There's no getting around what that is. It's hard. It's work. That's just the bottom line. It's one of those things when you get to 40 as an academic, there's a fork in the road. And you can look around the university and you can see the people that haven't actually done anything after the age of 40. And they don't look good. And then you see the people that really made an effort and really went out and did deadlifting or biking or whatever it is. And, you know, that's the ones you go, that's who I want to be when I'm 60. I don't want to be the other guy. I think you've got only one year on me, so I feel like I'm the same way. I'm, I'm going to fight father time like crazy. There's no sitting around becoming, you know, that guy you just described. No way. I want to jump into something that I think will be interesting. You're one of the people that publicly was stating that you saw the Trump victory coming. I want you to get into the detail of it, though, your perspective and why. I have a feeling it's a touch more detailed than my perspective. Mine was quite simple. I I can't say that I made the the prediction. I'm not going to say that. But on my Facebook, I started writing about it and, and sensing it early on. And I have to say, just on a basic level, it was really That question, when he responded with the Rosie O'Donnell remark, I was like, wow, okay, I followed American politics for 30 years. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. I've never seen a politician answer a question like that. It was like game on. I'll let you expand there, but you've got a wider take as to why you saw Trump coming. And it also connects back to Brexit as well. So I'm a political economist. What does that mean? It means that to a certain extent, I care about agents, people who do stuff. And I care about how they think about the world, because the world is insanely complex. And none of us has direct access to the world as it really is. We all, in a sense, act on stories on one level or another. These can be economic stories like trickle-down works, which it doesn't. These can be social stories, right? But, you know, that's how humans work. We work with these kind of little stories in our heads. The story that we've been telling ourselves since about 1980 was the world needs to integrate, globalize, privatize, liberalize, and we'll all get rich. Well, if you're a political economist, you spend any time studying the data that we have, we know that we're not all getting rich. A tiny fraction of the world is getting rich. And even the much pumped globalization story that the whole world's gotten richer is only partially true. The best numbers we have show that the bottom 50% of the entire world got 12% of the growth 
from 1980 until today, but the top 1% globally made off with 27% of it. Now, let's take this into a local story. We know that the blink between wages and productivity broke down in 1973, that 60% of Americans haven't had a pay rise in real terms since 1980. How did we fill in the gap? We filled in the gap with the liberalization of finance. We went from having public deficits backed by the states to having basically private deficits backed by nothing but increasingly precarious employment. For huge numbers of Americans, things have not been good. Then there was a giant collapse of the financial system, which bailed out the people who had assets and then stuck the cost of that bailout on those who didn't. And then we still have wage stagnation despite the recovery that's been going on for years. Now, along comes Trump. And Trump basically does one thing that the Democrats refuse to do. He admitted that there was a problem. He basically said things aren't right, whether it's talking to steel workers, whether it's the genius move he made one time when he walked into an area probably where the Democrats never went, I think it was Oklahoma or something, and said it's great to talk to the other 1%, by which he meant the military. For all of the talk of the Democrats about identity politics, Trump is brilliant at the politics of recognition. He recognizes the fact that these people really feel that all of the benefits have gone to a smallly on the coast and they're left with crumbling schools, crappy infrastructure and ever more insecure jobs. And they're one sort of paycheck away from bankruptcy if any of them gets ill. And the Democrats were singularly unable not just to talk about this, but to recognize it in any way. Now, when you put this in the context that so-called anti-system parties have been on the rise in Europe from even before the financial crisis, that these strains are common across the OECD, even if they're exemplified by the United States and the United Kingdom. And then you look at Brexit. You begin to think this isn't some kind of weird thing where this guy called Trump comes along. If Trump hadn't come along, we would have had to invent him because the system has shifted. Essentially, we're in a world whereby the system that we built since 1980 should have collapsed in 2008. But we kept it going with massive central bank intervention, liquidity support, trillions of dollars in asset purchases, just to make sure that those who have assets remain whole. And the cost of that has been continuing stagnation and continuing lack of wage growth for the vast majority of people. Now, at some point, you know, people are not stupid and they kind of put the dots together themselves and they go, well, if things are doing so well, how come nobody I know is doing well? And I just began to hear that more and more and more. And I thought, Trump's going to get into this. Now, had it been a more, let's say, credible Democratic candidate rather than Senator Clinton, the result might have been closer and it might have gone the other way. The combination of a tone deaf candidate who has no ability to either emote empathy or articulate a clear and coherent vision as to where she wants to take the country, alongside someone who basically says, you know what, for you 60% out there, I'm for you, she's for her. That's a very powerful set of things. So basically, I think it was by about June or July, I think it was June 16, I gave a talk here at, at Watson called Global Trumpism. And I think I said at that point, I'd give him 60% on. And people gasped and I said, no, this, this is all of a pace. This is all part of, you know, let's say, a global moment for Trumpism in general that, that goes far beyond Trump. For people that have a sense of a political pulse, you could just feel this was dramatically different. This was something that we had not seen before. And this is why the Democrats, I think, are in for a shock in, in November, because they're just basically playing this game that Trump is this illegal person who's done terrible things and the Russia investigation will unmount him and uncover stuff. And all of that might be true, right? Let's, let's not dismiss Mueller or any of that sort of stuff. But in a sense, it doesn't matter because you can get rid of him. The establishment Republicans have no resonance at all. We saw this in the primaries. And you're going to have yet another version of this kind of strongman populist popping up on the right because that's what we see everywhere. Look at Europe. That's the entire landscape has been transformed in this same way. Because people have lost faith in the left, because the left parties are essentially the handmaidens to this neoliberal globalization. They shorted their own core constituents in order to grab the middle, and the middle proved fleeting at best. So you look at the SPD in Germany, the ones dom one of the dominant parties of German politics since 1945, it's down to below 20% of the vote. The only left party in Europe that's growing is Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. 
But if you read the British press, you'd never know anything about that because they're united in his combination of him, his party, and his reported anti-Semitism. So the left is either disgraced, failed, or under siege, and the right is ascendant. Let me throw a big picture one at you in terms of the desire to get elected. I think, in my observation in the last 30 years, there used to be more candidates that seemed to be tied to something they really believed in, and they were going to pursue this, whether on the left or the right. But today, it seems like, almost transparently, all political leaders, and I'm saying primarily from America, but I'm, I'm curious if you would see it the other way across the world, but leaders seem to be just thumbing their nose at everyone and saying, you know what? We're just giving you a bunch of bullshit. We just want to get elected. We just want the power. We literally want the power reins. We don't care if we accomplish anything. We don't care if we do anything. We just want the power reins. It's like the worst of the worst leading us. Yeah, so the Germans have a great word for a moment like this, which is yein, which means yes and no simultaneously. So I can, you know, I'll give you a quote that sounds just like this. John Claude Juncker, who's one of the head guys at the European Commission, says that in 2011, we know what needs to be done. We just don't know how to get re-elected once we do it. Right. So you can take that as emblematic. Is that the guy that's always drinking and grabbing the ladies' butts and stuff? No, he's the one that I think, if I remember correctly, used to run Luxembourg as a giant tax dodge. And now he wants multinationals to pay taxes. So the hypocrisy runs deep. Let's put this in a broader context, right? Back in the 2000s, I wrote a couple of papers, academic papers, about what I called cartel parties. So what's a cartel? So imagine the following, because this, again, I'll give you a structural story rather than a greedy individual bastard story, right? So imagine that you're left-wing parties or center-left parties, and it's the Thatcher-Reagan moment. And those right-wing parties have said, unemployment is your problem. Markets will be liberalized. We're going after trade unions, right? The whole agenda. And the left-wing parties go, oh, that's terrible, don't do that. But basically, people's incomes are rising for the first time in, uh, in 10 years. The inflation of the 70s is dissipating. A whole new generation of people are beginning to form assets, houses, stocks, shares. And they start to lose, and they lose systematically. So over a period of 10 years, they go, you know what? Unemployment's your problem. Markets are good. In fact, markets are awesome. We love bankers, right? So this is the Tony Blair, Gerhard Schroeder moment. Now, when you do that, what you're doing is you're actually offering your constituents less and less policy choice. It's Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And when you have Tweedledum and Tweedledee, what happens is you get people on the outside, on the fringes of the left and the right going, this is just a cartel. This is bullshit. They're not actually offering you any choice at all. And they start to pop up in the fringes. If you think about the EU, what's happened there is you've had these cartel parties that have constitutionalize this cartel through the whole arrangements to do with the European Union, to do with how you size your budget deficit and how you do policy and all this sort of stuff. And that has left populations, think the Italians, feeling that they have no effective choice. What happens across Europe in the financial crisis is the incumbents lose power. You vote in whoever the opposition is. They do exactly the same. You vote them out. And the third time round, this is when you get Salvini, this is when you get uh, Cinque Stella, this is when you get the populists, particularly on the right, taking over. Because I said, as I said before, populations ain't stupid. They know that if you're going to give them 10 years of Tweedledum and Tweedledee, you're still driving around in your Mercedes, worrying about what private school you're going to send your kid to. And you're worrying if your kid's going to have a school to go to then eventually you stop listening to these people. Let's put some numbers on this. I always look at things in the frame since my a lot of my world has been about trading and traders. And I can think back over the last 25 years observing assets under management with particular hedge funds or particular hedge fund managers that had made a lot of money. George Soros has led the pack for a long time. But now in the last five to 10 years, this has changed so dramatically, and the wealth concentration, the bonuses, the amount of money, the disparity between, let's say, just quote, Wall Street across the world and the populism out there, the population out there, that has gotten so wide. That chasm is so intense. Why don't you put some numbers to that? Well, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact number, but I do remember the magnitude. In 2015, Wall Street bonuses were twice the size of the entire wage bill of everybody in the United States on minimum wage. That's a good one, right, you know, right there. If you could take the Oxfam estimates that basically there are five people in this world that own as much as the bottom 30% of the entire global population, 
which is just insane. Again, order of magnitude, it may be six people. I don't remember exactly. I mean, we can go through the statistics in terms of Gini coefficients, measures of inequality, all that sort of stuff. But what really matters on the ground is that do people feel that this is okay? You can have pretty unequal societies, so long as people feel there's a legitimate chance that they or their kids will have a chance to move up the ladder. And if you have that, you can sustain pretty high levels of inequality. But at the same time, if you feel that it's increasingly an insider game, if you feel that all the advantages are going to a particular class and they're hoarding them, and if that's the case, it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. It's this felt sense that the system is rigged. And again, to go back to Trump, right, he may have done nothing about it, but that was one of his main messages. The system's rigged. You guys are working harder than ever. You're getting less and less, and I'm going to change that. Well, you know, he didn't change it. He reinforced it. But nonetheless, that was the message that he got on to. I would love for your comment on this. One of the most amazing things that I've seen in America in the last 25 years is surrounding the Washington, D.C. area. So I own property there, 15 miles outside of D.C. Everything has become a McMansion. And what's interesting is in the early 1990s, it would have been perhaps in Northern Virginia, 70 percent Republican. That's entirely shifted to 70 percent Democrat. I'm not really trying to make a left or right point right there. I'm just kind of laying out what's happened. The amount of wealth that is concentrated in the D.C. area, if the regular American population really understood what's going on in the D.C. area with federal jobs and the largesse that's spinning off from that, I think you would have a pitchfork moment. But it's kind of not understood that wealth concentration by most of America, at least yet. But remember, you've got to break that out a little bit, right? It's not as if people who work for the DMV have been getting 30 percent of your pay rises. What happens is the vast majority of government workers have seen stagnant wages like everybody else, if not declining real wages. What's happened is you have privatized essential government functions to the extent that if you go to the ballpark in D.C., the road that's at the side of the ballpark that's got Kellogg, Brown, Root, all these sort of cut, all these uh, consultancy companies that basically live off privatized functions from the Pentagon and just charge hundreds of millions of dollars for things that we used to do ourselves inside the government. And then there's the lobbyist community that says, let's sell off even more, let's have more of this, and then they're all taking their cut. This is essentially the rape of the state. That's where that wealth has been generated by privatizing public goods. It's not the growth of federal jobs, far from it. It's the privatization of federal assets. For decades now, we've all kind of poked fun about how Russia was carved up after the fall of the USSR. You just make the point right there, and I think it's a fair point. Much of America is being carved up in the same way, just not as openly, perhaps. Well, not just that. You have a much wealthier country to carve up. If you start with Russia when it's lost 40 percent of GDP, privatize the remaining assets, people notice because there's nothing left. You can hack away at sort of American federal expenditures, which run into a couple of trillion a year, and have a, you know, you can make off with your slice without a lot of people noticing. Let me shift you away from these types of discussions for a moment. I want to kind of really pick your mind on a particular decade and kind of roll it forward. I'd like to talk about the 70s a little bit. I'd like to talk about long-term interest rates, very long-term, going back literally hundreds of years, and kind of outline what took place in the 70s and then into the early 80s to counteract the inflation in the 70s and kind of map that out. Because when I look at a long-term chart, and I'm looking at one of your PowerPoints right now, and as you say, we're going to stay long and low for a long time. So the basic story is this, you know, you're, you're, we're the same generation. When we did our econ classes, there was a moment of ferment and tension in the discipline because the old Keynesian macro orthodoxy was under assault, had been for some time, but the stagflation of the 70s, the simultaneous combination of inflation and unemployment, seemed to discredit Keynesian models. Now, I always thought that was a horseshit argument. It's perfectly consistent ways of doing it in Keynesian models. But in a sense, it was a generational shift. The guys who ran the shop from the 40s to the 70s were on the way out, and then the young Turks from the 60s and 70s were in. And the system had generated an awful lot of inflation. Now, why had it done that? Well, simple way to think about it is after World War II and the Great Depression, the one thing you don't want coming back is unemployment, mass unemployment, because then people turn fascist and burn your house down. The policy response of governments right across the world, from the United States to Sweden and back, was we have to maintain full employment. So to do that, you have to put financial 
finance in a box to stop capital seeking its highest return internationally. You like things that you can buy and sell and drop on your foot, which are seen to be job creating rather than just paper chasing. You really regulate your banking system in such a way that you don't have financial bubbles. And you empower labor to share productivity gains through COLA contracts, cost of living adjustment contracts, or corporatism arrangements in, the, in, in Europe. Basically, this is the golden age. This is when the American middle class does best. This is what the French call the Trente Glorieuse. And it's all great. Well, it's all great except for the fact that, think about the following. If you run full employment, like very tight labor markets, in the 19th, from the 40s through the 60s in the United States, and you're fighting giant wars in Southeast Asia off the books, your real rate of unemployment is probably about 2%. In that case, the dumbest guy in your firm can leave at lunchtime and get another job by 4 p.m. at a higher wage. The only way businesses can cope with this, particularly if they want to get skilled labor, is constantly paying more in wages. And the only way they can maintain the profit margins in that instance is by raising prices. So you've got a wage price spiral and you're pushing up inflation. At the same time, you have the end of the so-called Bretton Woods arrangements, which basically stopped international capital from flowing around the place, the growth of what were called the euro markets, dollar deposits, all of which were unleashing inflationary forces into the world. So as seen in the long term, the 1960s and 70s and 80s was this very weird blip. Six of the 10 great interest rate spikes in history occurred in that one decade. Now, when we were learning economics, we sampled that bit of the distribution and said, that's how the world works. There's always inflation and you have to be ever vigilant and we need to have in central banks and all this other stuff. And that's what we learned from that. But if you look at the long term, it's such an anomaly. Because the long-term real rate of interest is about 2% for the entire globe. Now, you're looking at the chart I got from a Japanese macroeconomist, but there's a guy at the Bank of England. If you go to bankunderground.co.uk, there's a guy who's went back and really looked at this and calculated all these interest rates from the 1300s uh, with using much better measures, much more comprehensive measures. And his conclusion is exactly the same, that basically the real rate of interest when you globalize the pool of capital is about 2%. That's where we are. The notion, particularly when you've globalized labor markets and taken all the inflationary pressure out of it, because that's why wage stagnation exists. You can't have wage stagnation and wage-driven inflation at the same time. And if you don't have inflation, the only rationale for raising interest rates is Larry Summers' one. You need to raise it now because the next time we have a financial bust, you need room to cut them. People are like, yeah, we're going to normalize, we're going to go back 4 or 5%. You might get there, but you're not going to stay there because the long-run real rate is pretty low. And this inflation fear, though, the way this has been used for decades to go at, as you talk about it in some of your work here, the definition of a stupid economic idea, I mean, the way this fear of inflation has been used to essentially rig the economy now, when does that fear ever subside? Or, or do the people in power realize that that fear is a useful tool to ultimately just keep power? Yeah, there's, there's two fears. One is deficits. Like, as far as I'm aware, no one's ever died of a deficit. But nonetheless, we have this fear that if you run budget deficits, the Weimar Republic is coming. In fact, the Weimar Republic is coming to Europe precisely because of this fear that if you don't balance your budget, regardless of economic conditions, all hell will break loose. And instead of which, what does it do? It increases unemployment, it produces deflation, and it empowers populists. There's a stupid economic idea. And the inflation one, I mean, it's real in the following sense. If you were a lender, if you were a creditor, if you were an investor in the 1970s, inflation had gotten higher than the rate of return on, on your expected rate of return. You know, let's say that you invest for a five-year period, you expect to get 5%, and the inflation rate's 10%. You might as well take your money around the back of the house and burn it. So investment collapses, and it collapses at a time that it impacts future expectations of investment. And guess what? Unemployment goes up at the same time as you get inflation. The more fundamental point being, if you were a creditor in the 70s, you got hammered. So if you want to have capitalism, you and I believe it or not, I am a fan. If you want to have a capitalism that works for everybody, you do actually have to have a real rate of return, which is positive. Otherwise, investment dies. And that was a big problem in the 70s. So restoring the real value of investment was the Thatcher Reagan project. What it did, however, was also hyper-financialize the economy, cause wage stagnation, and lead to a type of inequality in distribution that I think that if Reagan and Thatcher had been alive today, they probably would have said, hey, guys, I think we've went a bit too far. Let me dig back in time a little bit here. I want to take you back to some foundations 
you've got this great Scottish accent. We all know that there's some fantastic thinkers that have come out of that country. Why don't you take me back in time a little bit and give me some names, give me a point. I mean, you know, we, we all know the names of Smith, Hume, et cetera, but give me something that influenced you early on from the great Scottish thinkers. What was the real drive for you? What did you take out of it as a young man? Well, that's a weird thing. As a young man, I mean, I was raised on a diet of sort of contemporary macro. I mean, I wasn't really that turned on to the Scottish Enlightenment until much later. And, and the history of political thought became a kind of a passion in graduate school. But when I was younger, it was really the idea of Keynes. I mean, it just made sense to me living through the recessions of the 1980s as, as a very young guy and then going to school in the, the recessions of the mid-1980s, it was just permanent recessions, that it, it just seemed to me clear that the, you know, the macro economy is different from the micro. The, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. The collective action theory in any way tells you that individual decisions can be individually rational but collectively disastrous. When you look at it that way, the notion that we have to have this scalable thing that's based on individuals and their expectations, the so-called micro foundations, just struck me as nonsense. That ultimately the macro is different. That's a belief that I have maintained all the way through. Now, you know, can you trace that back not really to the Scottish Enlightenment, but what I do take away from Smith is, you know, first of all, Smith is quoted and nobody ever reads him. But if you do go back and bother to read Smith, I mean, a lot of the stuff that he talks about is very contemporary. The role of public goods, the notion that the state is important for regulation, all of that's actually in Smith. But all you ever get is this stuff about the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker and self-interest, which isn't even in the wealth of nations. That's in the, the theory of moral sentiments. My sort of attraction to those guys came later in life when I was attempting to figure out why it is that we think the way that we do. And you can see the hangovers of these ways of thinking. So Hume's essays on money and on interest could be written today if it wasn't for the rather prosaic language of the latter half of the 18th century. It, it affects them. To me, it, 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 it started with Keynes. It never really changed. I, I, like, I, got in, well, I read Kalecki's 1944 essay, 10 pages in the political quarterly when I was an undergraduate, that literally floored me. The guy predicted the 1970s and the 1940s in 10 pages. It's astonishing. So that's the stuff that's really had an effect on me. You lay out the individual versus the macro perspective. I'll, I'll pass along a personal view, and you can either correct me or go down the path. I look at decision-making in America right now, and so many people, the electorate, have a hand in decision-making. Let's just talk about kind of like the local and county state level where development can be literally hindered because so many people will get involved and block things. And if you really drive across America, you can see across cities, yeah, there's some redevelopment, but a lot of things just don't get done anymore. I mean, look, Manhattan would not be built today. With today's mindset, most of what was built in Manhattan would not be built. If I want to contrast that to something like China, Vietnam, Singapore, where you've had these benevolent dictators, essentially, really in the last 20, 30 years, do pretty good things from a macro perspective for their economies. And that's an interesting thing, I think, for Americans in particular to accept. Like, hold on, how are the Chinese like building Shanghai in 10 years and we can't get a new bridge built? No, I think that's true. I mean, Larry Summers actually had a famous piece on this about the redevelopment of a bridge in Boston. And once you took account of all the people involved, the Historic Commission, the Preservation Commission, the Environment, whatever, he came to the conclusion that, you know, you might want to spend money on infrastructure to stimulate the economy, but it gets gummed up and nothing happens. I think that's very much a rich person's problem, however, in the sense it's NIMBY, not in my backyard. I like the way things are. If you go to Minnesota, you go out to Michigan, then you're looking at collapsed infrastructure, roads that haven't really been seriously repaired and resurfaced since the 1980s. And that has to do with lunatic tax policy at the state level. They've got a collapse in the tax base. Politicians in the state level in the United States have just been basically elected by doing nothing but cut taxes for the past 20 years. And eventually that seems to have hit the buffers when we had the Oklahoma and spreading from Oklahoma teacher strikes recently, where teachers just came out and said, I can't have 90 students and 23 textbooks. This is insane. You cannot pay us less and less every year and expect us to stay in the profession. 
and I look at that, I don't look at NIMBY problems. I think NIMBY problems happen in Manhattan. But I think that when you look at the rest of the country, what you just see is a chronic lack of investment because the political classes have done nothing but enrich themselves and their buddies by cutting taxes for the past 30 years. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you've talked about in many of your presentations the definition of a stupid economic idea. I'd be amiss at this point in time as we kind of lay out some of this territory, this landscape in front of us across the globe. Given your experience, given your study, your research, what would be a couple of the big things we could do from a macro perspective? Look, nothing's going to be immediate. Nothing's going to happen overnight. But what would be some of those macro moments, those macro directions we could take as a society that would, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, get us to a better place? What would be a good one? I don't know. How about this? What was the real effective rate of taxation on Apple in 2016? Zero. They hide all their money somewhere else outside of America. So you have a situation in which corporates around the world are net savers and they pay pretty much no taxes. In 2010, because of write-offs, I paid more taxes personally than General Electric. That just can't be right. If you don't have corporates paying taxes, and they used to pay about between 15 and 20 percent of all taxes across the OECD and up to the 1970s, then you end up with ludicrously high profit margins, which is what you've got across many industries, particularly digital industries. This is why Google and Amazon and these guys are so rich and so powerful. They're also monopolists, which means that they either buy the opposition or they crush the opposition. So we're creating a very unhealthy, monopolized, cartelized economy where the corporates have got so much money, they're net savers. Now, governments are so afraid of deficits and all and doing anything at all that pisses off the investor classes that they too are net savers. They're running basically austerity budgets right across the world. So the only people left that can do anything are consumers. And consumers are net spenders mainly because their wages aren't high enough and they're continually spending money that they don't have by borrowing more from the financial sector. That's ludicrous. Number one, bust up the big monopolies, get a more competitive economy. Number two, pay taxes. I don't care if it's a flat tax on corporations, but let's make it a real one. 10%, everybody in, nobody out. With that, you could generate a huge amount of money for actually reinvesting in infrastructure. When the reason you do this isn't because it creates jobs, it's because it creates long-term productivity gains. It's very hard to see how you could create long-term productivity gains with infrastructure where you can make stuff, but you can't move it because the roads are so crap. So there's so much low-hanging fruit around here that starts with the maldistribution of profits and income, which we have allowed to happen, we have engineered to happen, because the political classes have been utterly beholden to the investor class. So as you mentioned, the busting up of monopolies, I've been pondering this myself recently. We're talking the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. And you've made the prediction about the populism rise from Trump to Brexit to others Do you see this as the path? I mean, because, you know, now that Trump's been in there, I don't recall Trump. I mean, he's talked a little bit about it, but I I haven't really heard anybody go in a serious, let's raise the bar, Rosie O'Donnell level of like monopoly busting. And it, it does seem a little bit crazy. I wish, look, Jeff Bezos is brilliant. He's super successful. But, you know, at some point in time, a guy that potentially could have a trillion dollar net worth, something's gone wrong. Absolutely. But also, I mean, let's do a Chicago model on this, right? What's the consumer surplus? Well, basically, everybody benefits because Amazon does it cheaper and everybody gets more stuff, so everybody benefits. So why worry about monopoly? Well, first of all, there's the latent problem. Once you've destroyed all of your competitor, what's there to stop you abusing that? Secondly, these organizations have more information about us than the security services do. And we know from Facebook's recent travails that they monetize this. You have these private companies that have the type of information that the East German secret police would have died for. And they're monetizing it with no oversight whatsoever, becoming more and more powerful, knocking out the competition. I can't see how that ends up as a good society. Because ultimately ends up with three or four people making most of the returns to most of the investments saying, just trust me, everything's okay. And you can bet that they'll have bought off every single politician along the way. So I'm often a critic of the European Union, even though I'm a fan of the basic political European project, not so much of the monetary one. 
But I got to applaud what the European Competition Commission of Vestigar has been doing by going after Google and Amazon and Facebook, putting this thing down called the General Data Protection Initiative, which has given everybody these really annoying emails about opting in and opting out. Because basically what they're saying is, hey, buddy, we're the state. We can blow up your business model. So why don't you play ball, start being responsible with your data, and more importantly, start paying some taxes. Because if you don't, we can make life really difficult for you. And that's exactly what we should be doing. Why the hell we're giving these people such a buy, I have no idea. Do you perceive anything on the horizon, though, where there really will become at least an American attempt to say Amazon's too big, Google's too big, Facebook's too big? Do you see that on the horizon? I do, because if you look at American history um, over the very long run, the United States swings from periods of intense monopoly and concentration. Think the period of the railway trust, the finance trust, through the Sherman Act, through deregulation, through, so not deregulation, through demonopolization, through using the courts to bust these things up. Then you get into the 1960s and 1970s, the process starts again. Then we get into the 1980s, the airlines are busted up, the banks are busted up. You then end up with sort of demonopolization with 9X, with the phone companies. You know, we forget our own history. We do quite a lot of this. And this time it's really serious because these types of digital tools and platforms are so powerful and so pervasive in our lives that the argument is very simple. These are public infrastructure. They should not be run for private gain. Let me take you back in time to 10 years ago, October 2008. I surely thought that the ATMs were going to stop working by what they were telling us on the local news shows. But since that time, we've had essentially pretty low volatility. The notion of tail risk, uh, potential black swans, I, I, I think people are starting to forget it's even a concept anymore. Is it even possible anymore? How do you perceive the landscape, the markets right now in terms of that particular perspective? Because it really does look like we have really finally reached that point that the notion of, well, it's just going to be permanent low volatility. Tail risks? Who's paying for tail risk? You're paying for tail risk? Come on, short vols, short vol, right? It's, it's totally insane. So let's think about this one. Let's start very micro. There's a great piece in Grant's Interest Rate Observer about this. I forget the guy who made the point, but I, I'm citing him nonetheless. He pointed out that Exxon had a crappy quarter a little while ago. Now, if you have a crappy quarter as a, a big company, you expect analysts to say that's bad, and then you're going to get some kind of downgrade, and then your share price will be impacted. And yet, despite that, the share price went up. And Apple's earnings calls every time, doesn't really matter what they say, share price goes up. Why? Because these stocks are embedded in all of the big ETFs. And so long as people are buying ETFs, and the ETFs are optimizing the index, and the index is going up, then essentially price discovery and all that stuff that you associate with markets kind of dies. Because you have this technology now that's almost 50% of the market called passive investing. It basically, whether it's a tiny little algorithm that's out there running in milliseconds or a life cycle in your pension, they all have the same structure. They're all optimization machines over a defined time horizon. And basically, they all have stop loss limits. And none of them are allowed to hold cash. Add to this the central banking community that's so desperate to lower volatility and encourage investment. They've chucked trillions of trillions of dollars into the global economy through QE. There's no inflation anywhere, by the way, so so much for the monetary theory of inflation. But nonetheless, they've managed to suppress vol. So then the little robots that are just robots just accept low vol as, a, as the normality of life, and they go about their buying and their selling and their optimizing, and the index goes up and up and up. Now, let's think about what's going on here. The European Union are simultaneously dealing with Trump's tariffs, Putin's malfeasant actions, the Brexit stupidity, and the Italians as a mortal threat. Is any of this showing up in any of the indexes? Nope. In the United States, we have Donald Trump as president, and the market's been going up and up and up. So we are utterly blind to risk. Let's think this one through. What's causing this? I deeply worry about all the passives in the market. Because ultimately, they don't know what to do if something really bad happens. Because they're not programmed to sit on the sidelines. They, have, they can't hold cash. If you imagine a world in which, for example, the Italians decide to really pull the plug on the euro or push the Germans into a corner, and you get a really severe market shock, what happens if you've got 50% of the market being traded by passives? Well, they'll probably all sell at once. 
Well, the argument is, well, it doesn't matter because there's active money on the other side that will pick it up. That's how active money works. It sees something falling, it picks it up, it's not going to make it back. But the thing is, you've murdered active money. It's so cheap to buy passives that basically the amount of active money in the market is, is declining all the time. So imagine a world in which you have an enormous number of bids out there and there's no asks and you just have this huge gap between the two. That's when you could see a massive correction, not just the return of volatility, like a one day spike that will scare the bejesus out of everybody. Now, we saw an example of how this could work in February with the VIX affair, the short and the VIX. This could go systemic. Right, well, nobody's paying attention to this because we're in this la la land where there's no such thing as volatility anymore. This is reminiscent of when Gordon Brown, the British Premier at that time, finance minister, says that uh, you know we've abolished the business cycle. It's like the minute anybody says anything like that, short them, short the hell out of them. As you were talking about the passives, and I start to think about the efficient market hypothesis, and it's like, okay, and that's on one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger is Daniel Kahneman. And I just think that if thinking people look at that kind of division and read both sides, to me, it just seems like Kahneman wins. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't know how thinking people can really say hey, this Kahneman stuff. It was good for a period of time. But here's the new way over here. You know, the thing about it is, right, I mean, if the official markets are both says, I mean, you know, the weak form is true. Right. So basically. There are no, you know, there are no ten thousand dollar notes lying on the floor consistently waiting for people to pick them up. Like opportunities will be arbitrage, but if it's a strong form, then you know why are there consistent opportunities to arbitrage? Why is it possible to make consistent alpha? Right, that shouldn't happen, and that's a piece of sort of technological justification for markets to exist in the form that they do so that super profits can be made. I regard it as a political technology. I don't even regard it as a serious economic idea. Mark, we could go on all day. I could sit here and pick your mind. I think ending it kind of on the thought process of tail risks and volatility eliminated, that's a good place to stop because, you know, let's just see what happens, right? Who knows what's going to happen? We're going to go another 10 years, huh? Do you think it's possible we could even go another 10 years like the last 10 years? I think that's a bet I want to take. The thing is, we often say stranger things have happened, right? But, you know, have stranger things happened? You'd be talking about the elimination of a cycle which is embedded deep within capitalism that comes from the basic actions of exogenous and endogenous shocks impacting investor expectations, the tendency of investors to hoard into particular markets at a particular time, to cluster, to overinvest in certain stocks or securities or pieces of capital, and the boomy, slumpy nature of capitalism, what Schumpeter identified as its creative destruction dynamic, it, is, it seems to me to be hardwired into it. It's the DNA of capitalism. And what we've done through basically central bank action and through the shift into passives and a few other things is to basically shatter that. And also the rise of these monopolies that basically buy up competition and, and eliminate uh, volatility through those mechanisms are also important. Plus emerging technological issues, which we haven't really talked about, such as AI, et cetera, and, and, and the optimization of big data. There's lots of things out there which are pushing down. But I mean, like we started mentioning the same, so let's end mentioning the same. The same like the idea, and I wrote about it with him in Foreign Affairs a few years ago, of volatility constraints. That ultimately what you're doing is you're pushing down on suppressed vol because it's still there, it's just suppressed. If he's right, and he usually is right, eventually that vol has to come out. That is such a true statement, right? And usually he is right. When I go to his Twitter feed, I'm just like, you read through and you're just like, what is the need that some people have to be wrong to go debate him? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. They know they're wrong. It's like they want to be whipped. They want to be punched. They know they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, a lot of the sort of, the, let's say he's not overly political and in a sense that he's not a political writer, but there are definitely political conclusions which tend towards the libertarian that come out of his writings, which I'm personally not comfortable with. But that doesn't mean I can't then say, I then say that he's wrong about these things. I mean, sometimes we just have to admit the limits of our own knowledge. Good stuff, Mark. I appreciate it. Stay on the straight and narrow. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep making really interesting predictions. Hey, where's the best place we can send people? Where would you like them to go to check you out, find out more information? Where can we send them? I promised myself I would actually build a proper YouTube channel, and maybe this summer I'll finally get around to doing that. But the best thing to do is just basically hit the videos on YouTube. So, you know, you'll get it from there. 
we'll take it from there. I'm also trying to rebuild a proper website, but I don't even know if people actually go to prop websites anymore. I mean, don't people just go to YouTube? I don't know. We'll see where it goes. I think they do go to proper websites, but when somebody like yourself has a million videos with millions and millions of views, I think that's a better place to send them. It's like blogging. Like People are like, you know, why don't you blog? And I'm like, but first of all, I don't have something new to say every day. I deeply distrust anyone who does have something new to say every day because it means that you're completely, you must be inconsistent on some level. More importantly, people don't read anymore. What they do is they watch. And if you can give people an interest in visual story while talking to them in a language and in a way that they can understand and engage with, that's actually way more effective than anything else. Mark, good stuff. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. All the best. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.